I appreciate everybody coming. That was, it's wonderful to see so many. And uh, as you all well know, we have with us this evening uh, Phyllis Bennis, who is the fellow for the International Policy Studies Program. And she's, she is the Middle East, their Middle Eastern specialist. So we're very excited to have her with us. Some of you may have seen her. Uh, I saw her on MSNBC, but she's also appears on Democracy Now! periodically. And she's an author of these two books. So they'll be in the back there. So um, she's an author, activist, and what else are you? <laughs> on many issues for a very long time. <laughs> and frequent flyer, right, right. And she also goes over to Amsterdam for something or other. Maybe she'll tell you more about that if you're interested. And then, so she'll speak for about an hour, and then we'll have time for questions before we close the program. So with no further ado, Phyllis Bennis. And here's your water. Thank you all. Thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you for maintaining my sanity. I just went through 20 minutes of being convinced that my computer had been lost or stolen, and it turned out I left it on my bed this morning. <laughs> what does that say about flying too much, being on planes too much? I, I want to really thank Peace Iowa and Veterans for Peace for organizing this, for inviting me here, inviting me back to Iowa City, although I confess we haven't yet been able to figure out exactly when I was here, but we know I was here once before. So I'm glad to be back in, in Iowa City. <clears throat> I'm particularly glad to be here at the kind of moment that we are seeing right now. We are in really a very, very dangerous moment. The threat of war with Korea is at a fever pitch. It's, I think, greater than we've ever seen since the Korean War ended, the possibility of renewed fighting on the Korean Peninsula. We have both presidents, our president and their president, posturing, baiting each other. That's a very dangerous development when nuclear weapons are involved. We know that our president is not one known for being willing to walk back from threats or red lines or claims that he might make, regardless of whether they turn out to be accidentally true or more likely not true. And when we hear language about fire and fury being an, the US answer to a threat from Korea, this coming from not only the most powerful country in history, not just the most powerful country around today, but the most powerful country militarily that has ever existed on the Earth, and the only country that has ever used nuclear weapons in war, for that country's leader to be using language like fire and fury is a very, very dangerous moment. There are certain things afoot that I think are important for us to keep in mind that lower the danger just a little bit. The South Korean president, far more rational than, certainly than his northern counterpart, but way more rational than our president, <laughs> has recognized over and over again that there is no military solution to the challenge faced by North Korea perhaps trying to build a nuclear weapon, and that there is only a diplomatic answer. I wish that we had the kind of emphasis and recognition of the importance of diplomacy that the president of South Korea seems to recognize, knowing that it is his country and his people who will be at greatest risk if there were to be, horrifically, any kind of a military strike in Korea. The other thing that I think is important for us to keep in mind is that in our country, people aren't buying it. That's important because our people have bought into a lot of our recent wars. So far, at least, people are afraid, angry, reacting in kind of weird ways sometimes, but they are holding on to their sanity. So that in a recent poll, we had 
75% of people in this country saying that we should be using diplomacy before any kind of military is even considered. And in an arena where we know diplomacy has become much more difficult because we don't have diplomats, because they haven't been appointed, and because we've cut the budget of the State Department by 30% to give that to the military, we're kind of in trouble. But people get it. That's important. People get that diplomacy over war is really important. 86% of people in this country say that there must be direct talks with North Korea before we even consider any kind of military strike. That's huge. That's important. And that's exactly what's going to have to happen. And then another 75% said that there could be no preemptive military strike by the United States as long as the South Korean president was saying no. And come back to number one, the South Korean president is saying no. So this gives us a little bit of hope that people have not completely lost their minds. In the White House, I make no judgment. <laughs> but we're not all in the White House, which is probably just as well. And the rest of us have not lost our minds. All of this, of course, is taking place in the context of another kind of very dangerous moment. You know, it's based on this fallacy. It's based on this false claim that somehow you can have a serious commitment to non-proliferation, meaning no additional nuclear weapons anywhere, without a commitment to nuclear disarmament. And when you think about it, why would you think that was going to happen? You know, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, the NPT, which is like the grandmom of all nuclear treaties, right, is very clear. It has two big components. It has the five official recognized legal, even if not legitimate, nuclear weapons countries that happen to be the same five countries that serve as the permanent members of the UN Security Council the US, Britain, France, China, and Russia. And then it has the rest of the world. So you had these nuclear powers and the rest of the world. So the nuclear powers said, we want all you people to not ever get a nuclear bomb and to sign an agreement saying, you will never try to build a nuclear bomb. And the other countries said, well, yeah, and what are you going to give us, you nuclear states? What are you going to give us to make that make any sense? And the promise was, in Article 6 of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, the nuclear weapons countries, including the United States, led by the United States, the only country that's ever used nuclear weapons, we have to keep reminding ourselves of that, promised to move towards what the treaty calls full and complete nuclear disarmament. Full and complete nuclear disarmament. No ifs, ands, and buts. In return for that, in Article 4, the other countries agree they will never try to build a nuclear weapon, and they will get access to nuclear power, which they wouldn't, but nonetheless, it's there, nuclear power and nuclear technology to build nuclear power plants. That was the trade-off. If you talk to anybody in Washington, even in the past, and this is not new to Trump, although it's a, taken to a whole new level, but during the regime of George Bush, during the regime of Bill Clinton, during the regime of Barack Obama, if you talk to anybody about, so when are you going to start moving towards full and complete nuclear disarmament, they'd laugh in your face and say, we, we know that's not really serious. And I'm like, well, excuse me, but you signed it. That makes it serious. But that was never something real. That was never something that they actually moved towards. So why do we think the other side is going to keep their part of the bargain? Why do we think that you can have non-proliferation and not have disarmament? The answer is you can't. So long term and even medium term, we've got to start talking about nuclear abolition. If we're serious about not having a bunch of North Koreas building a bunch of new nuclear weapons, which is certainly not going to keep anybody safe. You know, North Korea is looking at other examples. It might be a, a crazy regime in some ways, but they're not stupid. They can read history, and they do. And they're looking at the examples of what happened to countries that have nuclear weapons, what happens to countries that give up their nuclear weapons or their nuclear weapons capacity. They're looking at something like the model of Libya, 
Libya was well on its way to having a nuclear weapon in the early, the late 1990s and early 2000s. And the leadership in Libya agreed to give up their nuclear weapons capacity in return for normalization of relations and some new trade. And what happened when the US and NATO went in to carry out a regime change operation? The result was the overthrow, torture, and murder of the Libyan leader, challenged as he was when it comes to things like democracy, but nonetheless. And North Korea and other countries are looking at Libya and saying, wait a minute, they didn't have nuclear weapons, and that's what happened to them. We, haven't, we do have a nuclear weapon. Nobody's invading us. So how do we balance that? And the answer is, you take seriously that a nuclear weapon provides some kind of deterrent. It's not a good thing, but it's a military reality. So when you have a president, as we do, who seems to prefer war over diplomacy rather than the other way around. Um, one of the problems is it's not at all clear that this White House understands how nuclear war is different than other wars, that nuclear weapons are different than any other weapons, that there's a reason there's a whole separate set of laws prohibiting nuclear weapons that don't exist about prohibiting guns. Now, we can argue about whether they should, but that's for another time. But there's a reason because of what it does to the Earth, because of the massive number of people, all civilians, who will be slaughtered by the use of a nuclear weapon, this is not just one more tool in your military toolbox. So that's what we are, that's what we are facing right now. And again, this isn't new. Just like the current global war on terror is not new. The US has been at war with terrorism for 16 years. And terrorism is doing just fine. Terrorism is thriving. And when we think about that, when we think about liberating Mosul, as we were hearing about, now we're talking about liberating Raqqa in Syria from ISIS. ISIS is a horrific terrorist organization. Let's not pretend otherwise. It's vicious, cruel, misogynistic towards women horrifyingly sectarian towards anyone who doesn't believe in their version of extremist understanding of Islam. It's a real distortion of Islam. But when we talk about liberating those cities, we have to remember back to Vietnam, to the famous statement, we had to destroy the village in order to save it. When we talk about Mosul, we're not talking about saving or destroying a village. We're talking about destroying, not saving, a city. A city that had a population of over 400,000 people. We don't know how many thousands died in Mosul. Mosul is now liberated. ISIS has been routed from the city. That's a good thing. Nobody in, in, in Mosul is forced to live under ISIS. But ISIS was not the only problem for the people living in that city. The city has been largely destroyed. People have not been able to go back to their homes. ISIS destroyed a great deal of the infrastructure. But it was US bombs, US drones, US airstrikes, US F-16s, US helicopters that destroyed the city and said, now it's liberated, now that it's gone. We're doing the same thing in Raqqa which had been declared as the so-called capital of the ISIS caliphate in Syria. And now the US slowly, slowly is backing their troops the same way, using their own bombers and ground troops from the area, many of them Kurdish ground troops, to take over Raqqa from ISIS. Good, ISIS will no longer be in charge of this city. A city of 250,000 people, the vast majority of whom have already been driven out, and again, thousands have been killed. We don't know how many. And we will not know for a long time because many are buried under the rubble of buildings hit by US airstrikes. Those are our casualties. ISIS killed plenty of people. We are killing more. And that's a very serious reality when we think about what this 
global war in terror, against terror, is supposed to be all about. When we hear about the need to escalate in Afghanistan, and the choice is, do we send more troops? Do we send 5,000 more US troops? Or do we take Eric Prince's advice, the guy who created Blackwater, and you all remember what Blackwater was responsible for in Iraq, who now has his new proposal that gets into the pages of the New York Times as an opinion piece. And he goes and meets with the White House and says, you don't have to send 5,000 more troops to Afghanistan. We will send 5,000 of our private military contractors, otherwise known as mercenaries. It'll be cheaper. And you don't have to worry about them. And oh yeah, by the way, they won't be bound by international law. Won't that be convenient? So those are the options we're presented with. Do we send 5,000 more troops? Or do we send 5,000 more mercenaries? The possibility of diplomacy, of negotiations, does not seem to be on anybody's agenda. And we are seeing this throughout the region. We're seeing the lack of serious diplomacy. If we talk about Israel-Palestine, where there has been no serious diplomacy for years, not because everybody knows we don't want conflict. Well, actually, some people do want conflict. Let's be clear about that. But also because the need for real negotiations implies the need for negotiations based on international law, not based on maintaining US control of the region through its support for Israel. You know, how many of you have heard the status quo today is unsustainable? We need negotiations. How many of you have heard that? Come on, admit it. I'm not asking if you believe that they meant it, but have you heard it on TV? And the answer is probably for most of you. Yes, that's the line. The status quo is not sustainable. Well, you know what? If you're an Israeli, the status quo is completely sustainable. It's completely sustainable. It's not to say that Israelis face no threat and there's never any violence. On occasion, there is some small-scale violence. But it is not an existential threat to their country. It is not an existential threat to the vibrant democracy for Israeli Jews that shapes the Israeli political system. It's not a threat to any of that. For Palestinians living under Israeli occupation in the West Bank, under Israeli siege in the Gaza Strip, or as second or third class citizens of Israel, as Palestinian citizens of Israel, the status quo is not sustainable. The UN told us several years ago that by the year 2020, Gaza will likely be uninhabitable. 93% of the water is undrinkable. And of the 7% that's left, it's barely drinkable. In a new report just a couple of weeks ago, the UN said that it might happen sooner, that it might be as early as next year, 2018. Gaza might become uninhabitable. And yet Gaza is inhabited by almost 2 million people. It's about 1.8 million Palestinians. 80% of them refugees. 80% dependent on UN food aid just to survive. And more than 50% are children under the age of 15. That's who we are punishing, because we don't like the government they elected in 2006. And this is what we are facing right now. The conditions in Gaza are worse than ever. In East Jerusalem, you saw the, the, uh, the uprising of a sort that took place around the Israeli effort to control the Al-Aqsa Mosque against all of the agreements that have been in place for decades. In the West Bank, there are new settlements on a practically daily basis. And once in a while, someone in the US says, well, we think the settlements are not helpful. Really, not helpful. <laughs> They don't usually say what the whole world knows to be the case, that they are illegal, that they are an act of war. They are in violation of the Geneva Conventions that explicitly prohibit, I think it's Article 33, explicitly prohibit the transfer of population from the occupying power to the occupied territory. This is precisely what Israeli settlements are all about. And even in this year's 
State Department report on Israel and the occupied territories, there was a fascinating acknowledgment about what the Palestinians face. And here's the quote. They face a lack of hope in achieving Palestinian statehood. They face Israeli settlement construction in the West Bank, settler violence against Palestinians in the West Bank, the perception that the Israeli government is changing the status quo on the Haram el-Sharif Temple Mount, and Israeli military tactics that the Palestinians consider overly aggressive. Those are the words of the US State Department. Despite that, we hand the Israeli military more than $10 billion every year without a word of question, what are you gonna use the money for? Is this 10 billion going to help you construct something that no other country has? Israel is the only country in the world that has something called the juvenile military system, the juvenile military justice system. So a child over the age of 10, say in the West Bank, a Palestinian kid throws a stone, an Israeli kid who throws a stone, settler kid, is treated the way we claim to treat our children. We don't always do it right. But our juvenile justice system is officially based on the understanding that it's in the interest of the child. It's not designed to punish. It's not designed for security of the community. It's designed to be in the interest of the child. And if a child is misbehaving, then the goal of the, of the justice system, the juvenile justice system, is to figure out what's going on with that kid and what does she need or what does he need to not do that anymore. It's about the interest of the child. The Israeli court system for juvenile Israeli kids is exactly the same. It's in the interest of the child. The parents must be there. There must be a lawyer. It's not about coercion. It's not about punishment. It's in the interest of the child. If that child is a Palestinian, five feet away from where that same Israeli kid threw a stone, if a Palestinian kid throws a stone, he can be taken to the juvenile military justice system. He is often arrested not at that moment, but in his house at 2 o'clock in the morning, deliberately, they've said, to maximize the fear, taken away from his parents. The parents are not told where he's being taken. No lawyer is allowed to be present. Taken to a prison across the border inside Israel, not his own country. Interrogated, sometimes in a language he does not speak. Asked to sign a Confession in a language he does not speak or read or write. And these are children. They can be as young as 10, a 12. They can be as young as 12. There's something profoundly immoral about that, aside from it being illegal. So we don't ask the question, does our $10 billion every year, $10 billion of our tax money, is that helping to build that juvenile justice military system for Palestinian kids, I don't know. And nobody seems interested in changing. Now, we should be clear here, there's some good news also. There's always some good news. The US policy has not changed. That's not the good news. That's the bad news. The good news is that the public discourse and the media reporting is massively different. The media discourse is still pretty bad. But it's way better than it's ever been if you look back over five years, 10 years, 20 years. It's never been as good as it is now. And it's as good as it is now, bad as it is in some ways, because people have been working for years in movements whose job it is to change the US discourse on this very tricky question. And one of the results is that part is working. Public discourse is way different than it used to be. It used to be when people like me and others would stand up and give speeches like this, there would have to be police around the room, or at least people would think they needed police around the room. It's like, hello, I'm just going to get up here and talk. I'm a Jewish girl from California. You could listen to me, not listen to me. You could leave, you can stay, whatever, ask a question. You don't have to have cops here. People don't have cops here anymore. People were always asking me, what do we do if we get attacked? You don't get attacked very much anymore. Now, there are attacks that are underway, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But at the public level, and even somewhat it's starting to hit in the pestilential capital of this country, the city I live in and love in certain ways, 
In Washington, we're starting to see some of the results. We know our democracy doesn't work well enough that when we have public opinion saying one thing, that that means that's going to be the policy. It doesn't work. But it does mean that without that change in US public discourse, you can't even imagine a policy shift. So it's a necessary but not sufficient part of changing the policy. So look what we can point to. A year and a half ago, the Prime Minister of Israel comes to Washington, takes over the, 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 the Congress, addresses the joint session of Congress to tell these members of Congress, and he's doing it like this, he's lecturing them what they should be doing, that they should be voting against their president, as if he owned the place. I mean, really, the chutzpah of it. But that's neither here nor there. What was fascinating was that 60 members of Congress skipped the speech. That had never happened before. 60 members, publicly. Now, there may have been some others who just said, I'm just not going to show up. But 60 went public and said, I refuse to do this. I refuse to allow my, the, uh, the, our American house, the Capitol, to be taken over by this guy who is not our leader who's there to tell us we should vote against our president. Now, granted, not everybody who skipped the speech was doing it out of concern for what Israel is doing to the Palestinians, whether it's settlements, whether it's Gaza, whether it's the threat of another war against Gaza, whether it's putting children in prison. That was true for many. For others, it was because Netanyahu had been so thoroughly racist towards their president and members of the Congressional Black Caucus, long known as the conscience of the Congress, said, we are not going to put up with this. And they skipped the speech. That was huge. And you know what else was huge about it? The sky didn't fall. None of them lost their next election. That was the amazing part. It was like normal, the way it always normally happens. Somebody comes to speak, and some members of Congress say, no, I don't think that person has a very good record on human rights. I'm not going to go. That's normal. Israel was always the abnormal one was always the one that you couldn't say no, even though you knew the human rights violations were terrible. The international law violations were terrible. But we give them all this money. They, we have to protect them. Their views are like ours. They're a democracy like us. And people were finally saying, you know what? If this is their position, they are not like us. We do not share the, the values of occupation and apartheid. Because when you have two separate legal systems for the same territory for two different populations that's determined by race, language, ethnicity, religion, et cetera, that's the definition of apartheid. You can call it what you want. Ironically, the Israelis call it apartheid too. They just use the word in Hebrew, hafrada, instead of the word in Afrikaans, which is apartheid. Both words mean separation. So everybody uses the same language. They just say it in different languages because in some languages it's kind of more powerful. So that's kind of where we are on the discourse shift. We have a long way to go. We have a lot of work to do on that one, to turn the discourse shift into a real policy shift. But let's not forget what we have accomplished so far. It's been amazing. Organizations like Jewish Voice for Peace, I'm lucky enough to serve on the board of that one, the US Campaign for Palestinian Rights, which groups about 350 different organizations that work on this question. These are all important organizations that are doing amazing work. And it's paying off. It's actually having an impact. We do see differences between the presidents of our country. Big differences. Not so much in the wars. The nature of the wars are different, but the wars themselves continue. But the way our governments portray what our country is about and what our relationship could be, even if it's only aspirational, in the Middle East is entirely different. So if we look at President Obama's opening speech when he said, I want to not only end wars, I want to end the mindset that makes us go to war, that was huge. And he went to Cairo and gave this amazing speech. He was talking to people, not to their leaders. He was talking to young people, to students. And he was talking about being open to political Islam and that how there can be so many different definitions of what political Islam could look like. And he talked about the need for a deal with Iran. This was before the Iran nuclear deal was even figured out. But he was already talking about how we need it. 
his foreign policy legacy is going to be one that is very, very mixed. He will have many failures in his legacy. He failed in Afghanistan. The first thing he did was to escalate in Afghanistan. He will be known to have failed in Iraq, because even though he withdrew the troops, he then sent them back in two years later and began the bombing campaign again. He will have failed in Iraq. He failed in Libya big time. And he's failed in the current wars that are underway, whether it's Yemen, whether it's Syria. He's failing. His legacy is that of failure there as well. But he has three huge successes that will shape his legacy in foreign policy. One is the Paris Climate Accord. Another is the moves towards normalization of relations with Cuba. And most important of all, the Iran nuclear deal. That will be his legacy. And each of those accomplishments was made possible by putting what? By putting diplomacy over war and not the other way around. That's what made it possible. That's what made the potential for success even a, an option in this crazy world of wars popping out everywhere we go. What we see now with, with President Trump is exactly the opposite. The focus is already on war instead of diplomacy. What message does it send to the world when the first budget that you even talk about calls for slashing the budget of your diplomats by 30%? Of course you're not going to have diplomacy. You don't have any diplomats partly because they haven't appointed any of the high-ranking ones, but then you slash the budget so you don't even have any people there, you don't have any experts there to do the work of diplomacy. 30% of the State Department budget to go right to the Pentagon because Trump said he wanted to raise the Pentagon budget by $54 billion. And what did Congress do? They said, okay, we won't do that. We'll raise it $79 billion, and now it's finally up to about $85 billion, more than the existing $555 billion of the current military budget. And we wonder why we have trouble paying for things like jobs and health care and education and infrastructure when 54 cents out of every discretionary federal dollar goes to the military. Why do we even have to think about that? That's the legacy. It's a very dangerous moment. Back in the region, we have this weird little bromance going on between the crown princes of the United States and Saudi Arabia. Jared Kushner and the crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman, have formed this little duo that is calling for a bunch of really dangerous policies. Most dangerous of all is the war in Yemen, which was very much the product of Prince Mohammed and one that Jared Kushner has fully signed on to. But they are moving towards, as we saw when President Trump went to the region and created, remember they talked about this being a great anti-terrorism uh, anti conference, an Arab anti-terrorism conference, that's what it was supposed to be. What it actually was, was an anti-Iran mobilization to get the US in a position to be grouping all of the Sunni Gulf monarchies, along with a few other countries, Egypt, a couple of others, in this mobilization against Iran, to isolate Iran, to potentially prepare the way to militarily attack Iran. We're not going to talk to anybody here about human rights. That was a big relief for the Saudis, a big relief for the UAE, a big relief for Egypt, for Jordan, for Qatar, for all these countries. All of them are serious human rights violators. <laughs> yeah, it is a distraction. Sorry about that. Um, they are coming together to blame Iran for terrorism around the world that is largely coming from their countries. Whatever else Iran is doing, and it does plenty of bad stuff, human rights violations, military buildup. But Iran is not the one that is sending terrorists around the world and funding them, which is what we see if you track the money from places like Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and elsewhere in the Gulf.
The U.S., of course, in doing, putting together that anti-Iran coalition is also ignoring the role that Iran is actually playing in the region, which in many cases is on the same side as the United States. So in Iraq, this is a government, right, that we installed, we pay for, we arm, we train, and we give all the diplomatic credibility that they want. But they're actually a lot more accountable to Iran than they are to the U.S. And the Iranians are fine with that. They're fighting against ISIS in, in Iraq, on the side of the Iraqi government, on the side of the United States. Why don't we acknowledge that? We can't because Iran is the bad guys. We can't give that up. In Syria, it's true, Iran is on the other side relative to the regime in Syria, a very terrible regime. But it's also, like the US, fighting against ISIS in Syria, on the same side as the US. So this whole notion that Iran is the big problem in the region simply doesn't fly when you look at the actual facts of what, you know, what this is, what this is all about. There was an illusion when Trump first came to power that he was going to be an isolationist president. And a lot of people, and I admit I was one for a brief moment, luckily I didn't believe it for very long, but for a brief moment I was one of the people who believed that as bad as we knew he was going to be in terms of racism, Islamophobia, misogyny, all of these issues, the anti-immigrant mobilization, all of the terrible things he's done domestically, that just maybe what he would do in the rest of the world might not be as bad as the interventionist wing of the Democratic Party led by Hillary Clinton, who was already talking about wanting, wanting to escalate in Syria, wanting to escalate in, in Iraq. So what we see, of course, is that there is no isolationism militarily. There is a kind of isolationism diplomatically. We don't feel like we have to negotiate with anybody. There's a kind of cultural isolationism. We don't think that we should take seriously anybody else's cultural connections to anything because we are Americans and that makes us inherently right. Might makes right when it's us. But what we have is a fully militarized foreign policy. The intersection of military and, and so-called diplomacy has been completely taken over by the military side. And in fact, you see that it's, in, as it was in, in the Obama period as well, it's the military leadership, in this case, General Mad Dog Mattis, Mad Dog though he may be, he's the one in the room who's saying, wait a minute, let's hold back just a little bit before we start escalating all these wars. It's not Tillerson, it's not the Secretary of State, any more than it was Hillary Clinton. The same thing when it was Robert Gates at the Pentagon. He was the one saying, let's not go to war in Libya. And it was Hillary Clinton, the so-called diplomat in, in chief, saying, yeah, let's go to war in Libya. Let's do regime change in Libya. So this is a bipartisan problem. This is not just about Republicans. But we do see, as a result of the current moment, an incredible level of escalation of all these wars. We have escalations in Yemen, in the, in the Yemen war that is slaughtering children by the thousands. 12,000 civilians have already been killed in Yemen and something like 65% of them are children. There is a cholera epidemic that is now affecting over 300,000 Yemenis and they can't get treatment because, why? Because of the war. Because Saudi Arabia, which is waging the bombing campaign, aided by not only our arms and planes and bombs that we sell them, but aided directly by US, uh, US Air Force planes flown by US Air Force pilots in support of the UAE's part of that war, led by the Saudis, that is providing the in-air refueling of UAE and earlier Saudi planes to allow them to bomb more efficiently. So this is on us. This is our war. It's not just a war we're allowing to go forward. This is one that we are helping to make worse. And the Saudis now have blockaded the only port where ships could bring in the very simple life-saving drugs to deal with a cholera epidemic that, has, like, that we have never seen for the last 20 or 30 years in that part of the world. And instead, what we have is people dying. So 
we have this situation that is not new. The global war on terror has been underway for 16 years. And it still doesn't work. It's not going to work. They don't have to do it better. They have to stop doing it at all. Terrorism is a serious problem. It's not an existential threat to the United States. It is an existential threat in certain parts of the world, not here. But it is a serious problem that should be taken seriously. What we are doing is creating new potential terrorists. Because you can't bomb terrorism out of existence. You can only bomb cities. You can bomb people. Sometimes you might get lucky. You might hit a terrorist. Maybe you hit somebody who's on your list that says, these are the people we're allowed to kill. Really, what's that list based on? Who said? Well, we said. Who, well, who are we? What's this based on? It's based on we got in intelligence that so-and-so in X village said that this guy is a terrorist. Really? And you're sure? You're really sure that it isn't just because this guy owed that guy two cows from a dispute that went back to their grandparents? You're sure of that? OK, you're sure. Fine. And you go bombing them, and you get that guy. And then what happens? Even if you're right that that guy wasn't it wasn't a fake call. He really was a terrorist. He had committed some terrible act, had killed civilians, maybe. Even if that's the case, chances are pretty good that his family and his village and maybe his whole tribe and maybe his whole religious sect and maybe his whole country just might not think he was a terrorist anyway. And even if they thought maybe he was a terrorist, they might not appreciate somebody from some other country coming in and bombing him or sending a drone to kill him on a road. And some of the people who think that's not such a good idea might get really angry. And some of those people who get really angry, they can turn into terrorists themselves. So if we're serious about ending terrorism, what we're doing is precisely the opposite. What we're doing is setting the stage for a continuation of permanent threats of terrorism all in the interest of putting America first, right? Because if we didn't put America first, if we put the world first and said, what's it going to take to stop the reasons that young people, whether it's young men in Brussels who have grown up the third generation that came from Morocco three generations ago and they still feel like they're not accepted, they, get to, they go to lousy schools, can't get into college, can't get a decent job, so they can't get married because they can't support a family. And they've got nothing. And suddenly, some terrorist organization a world away starts talking to them and, and texting and whatever and saying, you know, you should come here where we will take you seriously. And they start thinking, you know, maybe that's not such a bad idea after all. What can we do to change those conditions? We, not, we might not be able to stop every terrorist in the world. There are some who are just pathological killers. They're sociopaths or they're psychopaths. And we might not be able to find and prevent every one of those. But we damn well have the capacity to identify the conditions that make other people start to think that maybe that's not such a bad idea. That's what we can change. Whether it's in Iraq, where we are supporting a government whose legacy of sectarianism is so severe that there are ordinary Iraqi Sunnis who have seen their country torn apart, first by the US invasion and shock and awe, and then by its occupation, and now by its sectarian regime and terrorist forces like Al Qaeda and ISIS, who are so angry at this sectarian, Shia-dominated government that we support in Baghdad, that they start to think that maybe ISIS is the lesser evil. Not because of how extreme they are, but despite that. We can do something about that. We can't necessarily do something about what ISIS believes and what they tell people. But we can do something about what the government that stays in power with our guns and our money, what it does to the Sunni minority in its own country. We can hold governments that we support accountable for international law and human rights, whether that's Israel, whether that's the government in Iraq, whether it's the government in Afghanistan, which takes the prize for corruption. And you want to talk about failure when you talk about a war against terrorism? Let's just look at Afghanistan for a minute. Many of you, not 
all of you, some of you thankfully are young enough that you won't remember, but some of you will remember that at the beginning of the so-called global war on terror, which started in Afghanistan, we're coming up on the anniversary, it was October 7th, the day the bombing started, three weeks after the 9-11 attacks, those horrific attacks that were such a crime against humanity, but were treated, instead of being treated as a crime against humanity, were treated as an act of war, as if a country had gone to war with us. And we said, all right, we're gonna go to war against Afghanistan. Even though the hijackers, none of them were Afghans. They didn't live, they were from Saudi Arabia mostly and a few from the UAE and, and Egypt. They didn't live in Afghanistan, they lived in Hamburg. They didn't train in Afghanistan, they trained in Minnesota. Went to flight school in Florida. So what were we doing bombing Afghanistan? But that war began and we were told that we were doing it to liberate the women of Afghanistan. Now granted, the women in Afghanistan then and now lived a horrifyingly difficult life an incredibly oppressed life. It's a really hard culture for women to grow up in. At the time that the US invaded Afghanistan in 2001, Afghanistan had the lowest level in the world, in all the rankings from UNICEF, of the lowest possibility of a child being born to survive to her first birthday or her fifth birthday, the lowest in the world. After 16 years of US war and occupation, Guess what? Afghanistan is still the worst place in the world for a child to be born and expect to survive to her first birthday. It used to also be the worst country for a woman to survive childbirth. Now it's the third worst. Not because it's gotten much better, but because Sierra Leone and Liberia essentially went through collapsed situations. So they were even worse. That's what the legacy is of our war in Afghanistan. And then the wars come home. And I want to talk a little bit about that in the last bit, because the wars coming home, I think, is really, really important. We have seen since Donald Trump's election and even through the campaign, an incredible rise in Islamophobia in this country. Physical attacks on Muslims, threats against mosques, attacks against mosques, the murder of a, of an, a young Muslim woman, in outside of Washington, D.C., the murder of two Indians who were thought to be Muslims. It's been a horrific period for Muslims in this country, even before we get to the Muslim ban. Just the treatment of Muslims who are American citizens, who are second or third or fifth or tenth generation Americans. It's been a really hard time for Americans, American Muslims and Muslims who live in this country. And we have to look at why that is. I don't think Donald Trump personally, I don't particularly care, but I actually don't think that personally he cares very much about whether somebody's a Muslim or not. I do think he's personally a racist. I don't know if he's Islamophobic on his own or not. It doesn't really matter. What matters is Islamophobia is necessary to build support for wars against Muslim-majority countries. We saw it in earlier wars. You saw the racist attacks on Japanese during World War II where the Japs were, were presented as buck-tooth, stereotypic, yellow-faced caricatures that were objects of hate and derision. Interestingly, given what was going on in the war in Europe, Germans were not treated in that same way. Why? They were white. They were white. They looked like me. So that was important. In the Vietnam War, young US soldiers were taught to think of the Vietnamese as gooks. In the first and second Iraq wars, they were, I won't say it, they were sand something, and they were towel heads. It's this kind of racist attack that is necessary. If you want to convince young Americans that it's fine to go off and kill somebody across the world, you have to demonize them. The demonization of this period didn't begin after 9-11. It started in 1978 with the Iranian revolution and the rise of the Ayatollah Khomeini as the leader of that revolution. I can remember t-shirts that had Khomeini's portrait superimposed on a dartboard, on a target. They were very popular in those days. 
that was all about Islamophobia as a way of building opposition to this country that we had been quite friendly with during the years of the brutal regime of the Shah of Iran. The same thing happened, ironically enough, when the US decided to go to war against Iraq on the second time around in 2003, when Saddam Hussein, who had been an ally of the United States throughout the years of the Iran-Iraq war, the US provided weapons, among other things, the seed stock for chemical weapons, you know, I'm sorry, for biological weapons. They came from a place outside of Washington, DC called the American Type Culture Collection. You know, how did we know that there was a biological weapons program? We kept the receipts. That was how we knew. So when all of a sudden we had to turn against this government that had been our ally, what do you do? I mean, granted, the guy looked like straight out of central casting as a bad guy, the big mustache, and you know, he looked kind of mean, and he always had a gun in his hand. But that wasn't going to be enough. They had to bring out the Islamophobia stuff, despite the fact that Saddam Hussein was one of the most secular people around and had massively suppressed any expression of political Islam in his own country. But nonetheless, it became a Muslim thing. It became opposition to extremist Islam. and. You all remember the, the propaganda about how Iraq, Saddam Hussein were the ones responsible for the 9-11 attacks. Really? Where'd that come from? You know, it came from out of somebody's head. It certainly didn't come from facts. So the wars come home. Islamophobia is no accident. It's no accident. And we see the rise of racism. We see the rise of Islamophobia in exactly that context. And then we see the wars come home when we look at the cost of the wars. If you want to talk about the cost of wars just here in Iowa City, I'm not, you know, we talk about these numbers, $568 billion. I mean, I might as well say a gazillion dollars. I mean, what, what's a billion dollars? Nobody knows what a billion dollars is. But it's a lot. A million dollars, that's a lot. When you start talking about billions, it starts sounding like millions or nothing. But let me just give you one example. This year, the military budget the baseline military budget was $568 billion, whatever that means. Now, keep in mind, that's just the, the basic budget for the Pentagon. What doesn't it include? It doesn't include the nuclear arsenal. That's paid for out of the Department of Energy. That's another $20 billion or so. It doesn't include veterans' care, right? That's somewhere else. And wait for it, it doesn't include the wars, the actual wars that we're fighting. That's a separate budget. They call it the slush fund. But it's basically another budget of about $68 billion. So this is the budget that sort of pays the salaries, keeps the lights on at the Pentagon, the kind of boring baseline budget. $568 billion, which means nothing, right? Iowa City's share of that budget just this year was $107 million. That's a lot of money. Now, granted, nobody really knows what that is either. But I'm going to tell you. Because here's what you could do with it if that money stayed here. That same $107 million could put 1,493 new elementary school teachers in the classroom. It could pay for 1,926 infrastructure jobs. It could put 13,048 children into Head Start. It could provide 11,975 veterans with health care. 3,320 3, university students with four-year scholarships, or provide uh, solar power retrofitting for 74,475 houses. You tell me what makes us safer. Wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and Libya and Yemen and Somalia and Sudan and who knows where else and maybe North Korea, or education and jobs and health care here at home. That's what it means to talk about the wars coming home. So finally, I just want to end with a question about the anti-war movement. We have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of work to do. We are a movement that has spent years, in the early years of the war in Iraq, certainly during Vietnam, being the leading movement in this country that was leading towards a, a better world, a more progressive world, a more democratic world. The anti-war movement right now is not the movement that's leading in this country. There are amazing, powerful movements that are leading. Black Lives Matter, the Dreamers, 
the immigrant rights movement, the movement against the Muslim ban, the women's movement that emerged so powerfully after Trump's election. These are the movements that are on the rise. What we need to be doing is getting into their hands, into their campaigns, these questions of what does it mean that 54 cents out of every, every discretionary federal dollar goes to the military. The people that are doing the Fight for 15 campaign to raise the minimum wage, why is that so hard when 54 cents out of every federal dollar is going off to the Pentagon? That's our job in this period. We need to do the protests. We need to do the vigils. We need to be prepared when there's a new escalation somewhere or, God forbid, a new war breaks out. But first and most, we need to be part of, linked with, connected to those other movements because the issues don't live in silos. The issues are not separated. The reason anybody can get away with saying we don't have enough money to provide health care for everybody is because we're spending hundreds of billions on the military. With $30 billion, we could provide safe, clean drinking water for the entire Earth for a year. That's like one third of, I can't even do the math, it's like a tiny little percentage of our military budget. What makes us safer? That's what we need to be remembering. And I would just leave you with something that comes from Dr. Martin Luther King. You know, in his Riverside Church speech of 1967, I, in my view, the most important of his many important speeches, the one where he talked about the links between racism and poverty and militarism. He talked about the arc of history. And he said, the arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice. He was absolutely right. But I think if he was here today, he would be reminding us that it doesn't do that on its own, that we have to make it bend towards justice. That's what lies ahead of us. Thank you all. We're going to have some questions, but first I wanted to tell you about something. It occurs to me, Phyllis and I, and Yasser, who was back there, I guess he's not anymore, but we're going to Des Moines tomorrow. Oh, there he is. <laughs> we're going to Des Moines tomorrow, and we're all going to be speaking in Des Moines at a conference. But I wanted to tell you, it, and I'm going to present a project there tomorrow, but it occurs to me that perhaps you people here would be interested in it. And I didn't bring any flyers for the project. But if you, if you, I have cards. If you want to know about the, more about the project or how to get a hold of the project, I can, um, I'll let you know if you contact me. Uh, just come and let me know you want to know more about it. This is a project called, it's a project where it's, we just heard about Gaza and how Gaza is becoming, actually I thought, Phyllis said that they were going to say that it was uninhabitable by 2020, which is what I thought. But, but somebody told me it has actually been year. declared um, uh, already. It's been declared uninhabitable. So one of the things, and you know, I mean, one of the things we've decided we want to do that is happening there is that they don't have any electricity for, except for maybe two hours a day. So one of the projects that we're um, Supporting, I guess is the best way to put it. I work with an org a national organization called United Methodists for Kyro Kairos Response. And one of the national organizations of uh, the projects that we're supporting is, is called the Lucy Light Project. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with Lucy Lights. Apparently, they're a camping uh, th thing. But what you do is they are inflatable. It's like a little balloon or a little. Um, uh, you know, beach ball or something like that, that you can blow in and inflate so that they, when they're packaged and shipped, we can ship them, they're flat. And then when they get them in the field, they can blow them up and they're, um, they have these little lights in them that is solar powered. So now um, the people in Gaza have a light so that the kids can study at night, the women can work, the men and women can work in the house at night, um, and so they don't have to worry about not having any lights or using candles, which can, as we all know here, can uh, cause fires. 
So if you're interested in that particular project, this, this group, well, they're doing it a couple different ways, but it, which are on, on this sheet. They're, they sometimes, you can just go on their website and say, yes, I want to buy so many Lucy lights. Or another way they're doing it is they're, they're, what we're going to promote it as tomorrow is get your church group or your Cub Scout group or whatever group you want to get together and raise some money to send Lucy lights over there. And then they will buy, buy the lights. I, I can't even remember the name of the group right now. I'm just really sorry. So it, again, if you want to know, just ask for one of my cards. And, uh, and, and then the other project is that they will buy the projects, send it over to people who will take a picture of the Lucy Lights that they're using and send it back to your organization. So I think that's a, a good way of doing it. Then you, you, can, you, you can know each other and get to see each other in a picture. So um, if anybody is interested in that, just please let me know. The other thing I wanted to briefly mention before we get to questions is that we do not have a regular meeting group in this, in this town at this time. Um, but if anybody's interested, we could talk about that too, because there's lots of stuff going on. We do have a uh, peace vigil, I guess we're calling it, down in front of the old Capitol. And we do that every Friday from 4 to 5. It's been going on, we figure, since the Vietnam War, although probably not consistently. But it's been going on a long time. We've had pretty consistent wars. So. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. So does anybody have any question? We do need to wait for the mic to have questions asked, because as, as we mentioned, we're, we're being videotaped and we're out live on TV. <laughs> Phyllis, could we have your take on the current status of the BDS movement? Sure. Um, the BDS movement is short for Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions. And it's a global movement, a nonviolent economic pressure movement that was called for in 2005 by a host of Palestinian civil society organizations. Not the PLO, not the Palestinian Authority, not any of the governmental types, but trade unions and women's groups and youth clubs and sports organizations and all the different parts of Palestinian civil society, 170 of them came together and asked the people of the world to help put pressure on Israel in whatever form <clears throat> is possible. And the, the form is nonviolent economic pressure, sometimes in the form of boycotts of Israeli produced goods, for some, it's only settlement produced goods. Others, it's for all of the Israeli goods as well as settlement goods. Sometimes it's divestment from companies that are profiting from occupation or apartheid. So there have been massive campaigns, for example, in this country in the national and international uh, organizations of the Methodist Church, the Presbyterians, the United Church of Christ, the Quakers, the Unitarians, a bunch of others, mainstream Protestant denominations, as well as the traditional peace churches have all passed really powerful uh, divestment issues, uh, divestment decisions. University campuses have passed both uh, small scale individual boycott campaigns like uh, Sabra Hummus was the target of, of one. And then there have been campaigns on, again, on campuses to divest from things like Caterpillar bulldozers, which are used to build Israeli settlements. Caterpillar, a US company, is making a profit off of occupation. On a global level, the economic impact has been extraordinary. In the US context, we're still building the campaign. It's been going on for 10 years, and it has had amazing small-scale successes. We can't yet say that we're having a huge economic impact yet, at least not compared to Europe, where, among other things, the largest cancellation of a municipal contract, this was the city of Stockholm in Sweden, had a $10 billion contract they had signed with a company called Veolia. It's a French company. They, op they operate in the US. They produce, uh, they do garbage collection. They produce light rail systems. They do water systems. They're one of these giant corporations that kind of does everything. They had a, a $10 billion 
uh, contract to build a light rail system between Jerusalem and the occupied West Bank. And there was so much pressure brought to bear on the Stockholm City Council to divest from that contract that they did. They canceled it. It was the biggest cancellation in European history. It was fantastic. We haven't gotten to that point yet. But as an educational campaign using these economic nonviolent methods, it's been hugely important. And globally, it's the most important thing going on to pressure Israel into recognizing that there is a cost, there is a consequence to occupying another people's land. You know, it's parallel in many ways to the banking campaign and the divestment campaign against apartheid South Africa, which some of you will remember. This was a situation where white South Africans basically were immune to a certain degree from the consequences of their apartheid system. They had these great privileges at home where they had legal rights that were completely non-existent for the black majority. And although they were isolated from the rest of the world, it didn't bother most <clears throat> ordinary people very much. What changed that, I mean, the banking, the banking system, all of that, when it came under pressure, that started changing elites in South Africa, the white South African bankers, the, the corporate types, they started feeling it. But ordinary South African middle class people or even poor people, white people, they weren't as affected until the sports boycott. Because their beloved Springboks, the, the soccer team, was about to play in the World Cup when suddenly, sorry, apartheid teams are not welcome here. Huge campaign to keep them from playing in the, in the World Cup. That's what hit. That's what hit. Israelis are not so sports driven as South Africans but they are very driven by science and culture. So the scientific and academic and cultural boycotts being developed around the world, including from some universities here, which are not aimed at individual Israelis, but at institutional relationships between US uh, colleges or universities and Israeli colleges, for instance. When that starts to happen, again, there we see there has been a real waking up among more and more Israelis who start to see that, yes, there is a consequence for what they get as benefits from the occupation. So the BDS movement has been enormously successful. As a result of that success, it has recently come under enormous pressure in this country. So organizations like APAC, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, which is the, the, the coordinating body of the Israel lobby, which has many different groups and organizations within it, APAC has been on the attack against BDS for several years now. And the most recent part of that attack has come in the form of a US law that is being debated as we speak in the House and the Senate that would make it illegal, a crime, not a civil penalty, but a crime to support, it's called the anti-Israel boycott law. It would make it a crime to call for the boycott or divestment from Israel in response to the call from an international, uh, inter, uh, uh, international multinational organization, meaning an organization of like the United Nations. Now, the BDS movement is not called for by the United Nations or the European Union or any group of governments. Multilateral, sorry, was the word I was looking for. A multilateral organization, meaning an organization of governments. If you were going to say that the United Nations is calling for BDS and therefore we will carry out BDS, this law would apply and it would be illegal. BDS is not called for by the United Nations or the European Union or the Arab League for that matter. So none of those work. And so we're a little unclear why they, they wrote the law this way. APAC wrote the draft of it. A bunch of members of Congress signed on to it without even reading the thing, without even realizing how it, it's against our own constitutional guarantees of free speech. And when it was called to their attention, people like Senator Kristen Gillibrand, who had signed on to it as a co-sponsor, took one look at it and said, oh dear, I think I better rethink this. And indeed she did, and she took her name off. It was a great victory because, what a surprise, she actually read it and said, no, 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 this doesn't make any sense at all. 
That's the campaign that we're launching now, is to get every member of Congress who signed on to it without even reading it to read the thing, and then maybe they will reconsider. But I think what's important for us to remember is two things. Number one is BDS is not yet illegal. Number one, this law hasn't passed yet. Number two, it's very specific in a way that doesn't apply to BDS. So we don't really know what's up, but we think they really did it to scare people. They did it to intimidate people. And as long as we stand up and say, we're not intimidated by this, what do you people think? This isn't intimidating, you gotta do better than that. But we also have to recognize that the reason they are clamping down like this and the reason they're going after campuses in, in particular because students are, are vulnerable around this stuff, is because they are losing the support of their youth. The rise, particularly in the Jewish community, the rise of the numbers of young people who are saying, Israel doesn't speak for me and I don't speak for Israel, who are critical of Israeli violations of international law, who are not willing to accept Israeli apartheid and Israeli occupation. So organizations like the youth wings of Jewish Voice for Peace, like J Street U, which is the youth group of J Street, these organizations are on the rise, and APAC and its efforts to get young people, they're the ones that are losing out. So that's what we're looking at right now. It's under attack because we're winning, because we're changing minds. Remember what I said earlier about the discourse shift? That's where we see it. That's where we see it. I love the name of that bill, anti-Israel, Israel anti-boycott law. Yeah. To me, it sounds like anti-American law. You know, actually, I wrote a letter to the editor that pointed that out. I didn't even mention Israel. I just said an, a bill in, in Congress was called the anti-boycott law and how I thought that sounded un-American. Of course, I didn't print it, but I wrote it. That's important. <laughs> Writing letters to the editor is important, even if they don't get published every time. Uh, you said that the global war on terror uh, has not worked. Uh, and it won't work, mm -hmm. uh, and that, in fact, we are stimulating terrorism. Uh, so um, why is that? Is it because our leaders are uh, really well-intentioned and good faith, but stupid? Sort of like uh, what Ken Burns says about uh, how we got into Vietnam? Or uh, do we actually not want peace at the highest level? Would we just as soon have the long war, the perpetual war? And uh, is not the, uh, the military industrial congressional complex really at the base of that? And then isn't that a, um, uh, a psychological hurdle that uh, it's hard for American citizens to even think that? Uh, and then once they say, yeah, that's the case, then to act on it. So yeah. uh, your comments on that. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I think there may well be some people somewhere in the US government that thought this was the right way to go and the useful thing and whatever, maybe. I don't quite know who they are, but there may well be some. But I think that um, when we look at the timing of how the global war on terror started and when, relative, how soon it started after 9-11, um, and we look at what the, the neoconservative uh, framework was, they had written long before that they wanted to impose a much greater militarization of foreign policy as well as parts of domestic policy. Uh, but they said at that time that what they needed was something, some huge event that would shock the conscience, and they said it needed to be like a, quote, new Pearl Harbor. That was the, the language they used. And they used, that doesn't mean they created the 9-11 attacks. It does mean that they took advantage of the 9-11 attacks. Um, we saw, we know that in the White House, within hours after the first attacks, discussion was already underway about going after Iraq. Afghanistan was somewhat of an afterthought, that that was a way to legitimize it, it seemed, because then we could claim that it's, they were the ones who attacked us, even though, of course, they didn't. But, um, so yes, I think that there is a, um, uh, a sense that, I think that people in elected positions of power often do want peace. The problem is their definition of peace is kind of the opposite of the definition that Martin Luther King left us with. Dr. King reminded us that peace is not just the absence of war, but the presence of justice. 
I think there are many people in US government circles, in US strategy circles, the think tanks, all of that, who would like peace on US terms, the terms determined by US power that keeps US uh, uh, exceptionalism at play. And it means precisely peace being defined as the absence of conflict, which in this case means the absence of resistance, not the presence of justice. I think that's the kind of peace that people in Washington often want. And certainly, there are those who don't want even that because they are profiting from the wars. It's another one of those canards that we hear all the time, no one wants war. And it's always said in that kind of syrupy, no one wants war. What is true is that the vast majority of people, including the vast majority of military people, do not want war. But there are a few people who do want war. And they are in very strong, powerful positions. And it's one of the things, I'm, I'm a very strong critic of most um, conspiracy theories. But there's one conspiracy I am convinced had to exist because I can't wrap my brain around how else it could have happened. Here is the conspiracy that I think existed. I have no evidence of it. It's purely speculative. But here's my speculation. Shortly after World War II, when the US was on a huge roll of producing new weapons, and lots of them, the beginning of the Cold War, we're ramping up military capacity. We're starting to move towards the proxy wars that are moving around the world. War is sort of on everybody's talk. One of the things that happens is that the actual production of all kinds of weapons, whether it's planes, whether it's bombs, whether it's guns, whether it's bullets, all that stuff, turns out within a couple of years to be produced in the most inefficient way possible which is instead of being produced in a vertical way where everything is produced in one place, you don't have huge transportation costs, delays, all that stuff, things are being produced all over the country. Every single congressional district has at least one or two or 10 little or giant factories that are producing some little widget that's crucial to some bomb. Maybe it's 12 people working in some little factory somewhere. Maybe it's 30,000 people working in the Boeing factory in, in Seattle, or anything in between. But every member of Congress now has jobs in their district that are linked to the war machine. And no member of Congress, no matter how anti-war they may be, no matter how honestly they may campaign against wars, is going to vote against the war production, the war budget, the war economy when there are 10 jobs somewhere that are gonna be lost if we're not making the F-35 fighter bomber. And I don't see how that could have happened without them getting together somewhere and deciding to make it happen. As I say, zero evidence, at least that I have, but in my heart of hearts, I am convinced that that's how it happened. Hi. Could you speak a bit more about the relationship between Iran and the United States, and specifically, what is the core reason, sorry, what, what is the core reason that the Trump administration wants war mm. with Iran, wants to isolate Iran? What, it, it, what is economic, geostrategic, and who are the sectors yeah. in America? It's a really important question, not least because it isn't only, this is one of the ones that isn't so new. Uh, it's not new for US presidents and Congress people and other officials uh, to want to isolate Iran, et cetera. We saw this, we were very close to war with Iran in 2007 uh, under George Bush. And one of the reasons, when we're talking about anti-war movements, one of the reasons we didn't go to war was because of the legacy of the February 15th mobilizations around the world when the world said no to war. That, that memory was right in there in those, some of those debates. But the question about Iran has to do with, it has to do some with, with money and trade and whatever, but it's more about strategic positioning and the leadership of the, uh, uh, of, of, the, of the region. Historically, in the Middle East, to be a regional power, you needed three things. You needed size of, of land and population. You needed money, which usually meant oil. And you needed water, 
Historically, there were only two countries in the region that had all three, Iran and Iraq. And not surprisingly, they fought each other uh, bitterly for who was going to be the regional hegemon. And that, that has also religious slash sectarian interests, uh, although those were never primary, but they were there. They were there. But mainly, you had that issue of who was going to be the main oil power, who's going to be the main military power, who's going to have the most important strategic links to the global powers as a regional hegemon. And in, into that equation, suddenly you have the US invades Iraq, overthrows its government, shreds the, the infrastructure of the country after 12 years of crippling economic sanctions that had shredded the social fabric as well as the physical infrastructure. And suddenly, Iran has no real competition as the regional hegemon. But by this time, the US doesn't have such a great relationship with Iran, because the US relationship with Iran had been grounded in its support for the Shah, who was the ultimate evil in the Iranian revolution. And it was US opposition, uh, sorry, US support for the Shah that had led to the massive level of anti-Americanism of that revolutionary process. It wasn't just because people hated the United States. In fact, most polls indicate that young Iranians in particular, but even older ones, are more pro-US than pretty much any other population in the region. But there was still this sense of what do we do about the fact that the US has been supporting this dictator that's been so brutal in our country. And so that was, that was the framework within which this all takes place. While that's happening, and suddenly Iran emerges, Turkey had been emerging. Turkey always had water and size, but it didn't have money. It was known as the poor man of Egypt, uh, uh, sorry, of Europe, I can't talk, the poor man of Europe for many years. It was a very poor country, but over the course of a decade or so, the early years of the AKP, the current ruling party under Erdogan, had made incredible gains um, economically while bringing a huge component of its population out of poverty, had, had really accomplished a great deal uh, in populist terms as well as in global economic size terms. So suddenly you had Turkey emerging as a potential competitor to Iran. But the other competitor that emerged at the same time was now Saudi Arabia. And Saudi had never been able to be in that position because it doesn't have water. It also doesn't really have a giant population equivalent to its size, to its land, but it has a pretty big population. That's where you now see the main, because all, I'm not going to go through all the changes with, with, Egypt, uh, with, with Turkey and its shifts away from what appeared to be an early move towards uh, a real focus on being a Middle Eastern quasi-Arab, if you will, power. Turkey is no longer in that, in that exact role. Iran is still the, the dominant regional hegemon, but its now competitor is Saudi Arabia. The water issue has somewhat been dealt with, because if you have enough money, you can do that with desalinization, et cetera, et cetera, and because of the United States. The US sees Saudi Arabia as its longtime ally in the Arab world. And so it is prepared to use the Saudis, because the Saudis are completely dependent on the United States, to train their military, to produce their weapons. You know, we're, we're, we're allowing them to buy literally hundreds of billions of dollars of weapon systems every year. And that's really important for that. Remember those guys in the uh, military industrial complex? They like those sales. They are the main, the biggest sales by far uh, of, in the world of US weapons. The problem is they don't really, they're not that good at using them. So the US helps in places like Yemen, that sort of thing. But it also helps in the political arena, which means going after Iran. So what we're about to see, I'm afraid, because I think that we're going to see the, uh, the, the Iran nuclear deal being maintained grudgingly, angrily, but I think it still will be maintained. And in order to do that, we're going to see what President Obama did, but we're going to see it on steroids under Trump, is giving Saudi Arabia and Israel, the two biggest opponents of the Iran nuclear deal, everything they want, which is going to mean more weapons, more military assistance, who knows what. So I think we're going to be in for a pretty grim period in that way. But that's kind of 
the main part. There's, you know, there's economic relations and corporate stuff, but really this is about who's going to run the Middle East and what role is the U.S. going to play. If Iran is the unchallenged regional hegemon, the U.S. is not entirely edged out of the region, but it doesn't have nearly the ability to use that region the way it wants to now, which is as a, what they call in the Pentagon, the lily pad theory, where they can jump from one military base to another, and from that region they can attack anywhere in the world. They can attack Africa, Asia, Europe. It's the center of the world. So it's that strategic positioning. It's like being a global real estate agent. It's all about location, location, location. That's Iran's curse as well as its great advantage. Wait. Turkey's Erdogan met with uh, Putin yesterday, and it seems like Turkey is changing positions toward Again. the United States, especially with their support for Qatar and their dispute with Saudi Arabia. Is that changing the, the dynamics in the Middle East? And also, Israel is supporting the, separate, uh, the uh, Kurdistan region, and yeah. also that's in opposition to, to many countries. Yeah, there's a huge upheaval underway in the region right now. I, I didn't have time to go through all of it, but certainly the split between Qatar and the other Gulfi states is a huge component of it. Uh, this fight between, primarily between Saudi and Qatar, but with Turkey coming in on Qatar's side, this is essentially, we now have a kind of three-way divide. You have the, the, the Saudi royals and their allies, the UAE, Jordan. Uh, then you have the, uh, the, the countries led by Qatar that are somewhat more willing to engage with the Muslim Brotherhood and its uh, its orbit in the region, if you will. So that includes Turkey now, that would be Qatar, Turkey, Oman to some degree. Um, and then you have Iran and its supporters in the region, which is mainly uh, Syria, but also to some degree Iraq. So you have these three blocks that are contending. And then you also have the potential uh, significant shifts in borders, both within Syria, uh, that's a bit less likely now than it looked six months ago, but it still could happen. There could be either the, the Kurdish zone in the, in the north splitting off. There could be a, uh, a shrinking of what the, uh, what the Syrian state looks like, et cetera. And the question about Iraqi Kurdistan, as you say, with the, the, um, the new vote supporting, uh, supporting independence, and Israel, which has long been a supporter of the Kurds, as the U.S. has been, uh, since 1991 at least, the Kurds have been perhaps the most, what's the right words, used and betrayed uh, of any nation around. They were, they were embraced by the U.S. at one point and then abandoned. They were embraced by the U.S. again and then abandoned to the ravages of, of Saddam Hussein's regime. They were embraced by the U.S. again, and now we'll see how long it lasts. Now Israel has emerged as a great defender of the Kurds. Israel historically has tried to build relations with all of the non-Arabs in the region. So it traditionally had strong ties with Iran under the Shah, with Turkey under the military dictatorships, uh, and with the Kurds. None of those are Arabs, and anyone who's not an Arab has a better shot at building some relationship with Israel. And that's one of them. So you're pointing to a bunch of different shifts that are underway. They're very dangerous. You know, any of these could blow up into a new war uh, right now. I mean, the, both Turkey and uh, Iraq, uh, no, sorry, Turkey and Iran are both conducting military exercises on their respective borders with their Kurdish communities. So it's, it's a very dangerous moment for all of this. Um, I'd like to use you as a fact check, if I could. I listened to a radio personality say that, in his opinion, one of the reasons that Trump is so obnoxious, so vigorously um, threatening North Korea is that Israel does not like the fact that North Korea is supplying arms to Iran. I would imagine that's a factor. Um, I think it would be a big mistake to put that much um, uh, emphasis on it. 
Trump is not uh, accountable to the Israel lobby the way many of his predecessors and many members of Congress are. Um, he is very pro-Israeli, as we've seen. But he doesn't have that ideological commitment to it. I th and politically, he doesn't view himself, as far as I can tell, as being accountable to anyone. So I, would th I don't think that um, that's the reason for it. Is it a factor? It may well be. Um, I mean, there's a lot of complications in, in, uh, in some of this stuff. In the new Muslim ban 3.0, one of the big mysteries is uh, Chad. Why is Chad on the list? Another one is why was Sudan taken off the list? One theory about why Sudan was taken off the list is because right now Sudan is providing troops to the UAE in Yemen under UAE control. And this may have been a gift to the UAE, whose ambassador in Washington is very, very influential in Congress and the Pentagon and the State Department and the White House, despite Trump. Uh, so that you know, those kinds of things do play a role. But I always think it's a it's a a mistake to sort of say there's one reason and that that's it. Israel doesn't make U.S. foreign policy. It has a big influence on U.S. foreign policy, but it's not the only influence. Anybody else? Uh, excuse me. I'd like to start by thanking you for the work you've done over so many years in terms of explaining and agitating. It's been uh, really, uh, I've gotten energy from your work, let's put it that way. Uh, and I have a humongous number of questions, so I'm trying to distill things down <laughs> let's just in, do one. <laughs> in, in some way. Well, I'm going to do two. Okay. okay, too short. One, one relates to what you just said a while ago uh, in terms of uh, Israel uh, and Arab. Uh, I'd appreciate you explain just what you mean by Arab. Uh, what does it represent in the opposition to Israel? Is it religion? Is it geography? Is it money? Is it ideology? Uh, just which of those things is it, or you know, you can take the easy way out and say it's a combination of all of them. Yeah, okay. It is the, that. The, 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 second, the second question is uh, being a creature of the 50s and 60s, uh, I see a large impetus for the movements that develop then. Uh, was visceral threats, I guess is a way of putting it, uh, the threat of nuclear annihilation and the threat of being drafted. Uh, in your experience, is a visceral threat necessary <laughs> to get a decent sized movement? Well, on the first question, um, the basis for opposition to Israel, I mean, I think it depends who you're talking about. Um, if you're talking about in the neighborhood that Israel finds itself in, it, to its chagrin, it always wanted to be European. But um, if you're talking about the Arab countries, you still have to define, are you talking about the people or the governments? Uh, for people, the opposition is b largely because of Israel's treatment of Palestinians, period, full stop, and its threats to other Arab countries and its seizure of land that belonged to other Arab countries. It's because of Israeli actions. The governments right now, I think virtually every one of them, I'm not sure there's a single exception. I'll keep thinking, but I don't have one in my head. I don't think there's a single government in the, in the Arab world that wouldn't love to normalize relations with Israel. Some of them have moved towards it quietly, kind of sub rosa, but they can't because even though most of, none of them are democratic and most of them are pretty, not just autocratic, but really heavy dictatorships, they still couldn't remain in power openly embracing Israel. Um, but they see that as a way to making nice to the United States. They see that as a way to increase their trade. Israel is by far the most important uh, uh, economic powerhouse in the region. So all of that is uh, at stake, and they would love to do that. The problem is that they, don't, they can't get away with it. If they could get away with it, they would all do it in a minute. For people, it's very different. People have long memories. Palestinians who were displaced from their homes in 1947, 1948, and what the Palestinians call the Nakba, which means the, the catastrophe, the dispossession, 
of 750,000 people who were made refugees. Most of them ended up in those Arab countries. So that reality is still very raw. It's still remembered. People don't forget that. So that's, that's a very visceral, I mean, you talk about visceral connections, that's a visceral part. The other part of your question, the other question about a visceral movement, I think that it's certainly true that the movement during Vietnam mm -hmm. was fueled a lot by uh, the fear of being drafted uh, or the fear of people one cared about being drafted. And the fear of nuclear annihilation did uh, help build the, the anti-nuclear movement. But I think it would be a mistake to sort of say that's the, the requirement or that's the only way it could happen. There was a huge movement against the war in Iraq in 2002 and 2003 when nobody thought that we were going to be at war in the United States. There was no draft except the draft of poverty, the draft of lack of opportunity, the lack of in one case that I know of lack of health care, somebody went into the military. You know, so there's all of those things are in play. Um, and yet there was this enormous anti-war movement that was global, where there were, beef, according to the Guinness Book of World Records, between 12 and 14 million people on the streets of February 15th on one day when the world said no to war. And that wasn't because people around the world thought that they were going to be put at risk physically, directly, by that, viscerally, by that war. It was because of the outrage that this was not just a violation of international law, but it was a violation of morality. It was, it was the idea that they were going to go to war in the face of massive global opposition just was unacceptable. I think it's also true that movements look different at different times. And if we keep trying to say that our movement is a success or a failure based on how many people we can put in the streets, we're going to fail. This is not a period where our movement can put large numbers of people in the streets, and I frankly don't think it's a good use of our time to try. It doesn't mean we shouldn't be in the streets. We should be in the streets. We should be in the streets with Black Lives Matter. We should be in the streets with the protests against ICE that are protecting sanctuary cities and protecting people from being deported. We should be in the streets with the Women's March. We should be in the streets with the Science March. My God, that we have to have a march to defend science? I mean, we, there, there's death. this is a desperate moment. This is a desperate moment, and we should be in the streets with all of them. And in that context, we should be working with the leaders of those movements to say, and how do we bring to, to life what we all know is at stake here, that we know there's one of the reasons that we don't have enough money for health care for everybody right now today is that 54 cents out of every federal dollar still goes to the military. We have to make that part of these other movements. And that's how we build our movement, is by making it a component of everything else, not by asking people, come to our events, come here, Phyllis Benna speak. No, I mean, that's fine, but it's, you know, I like speaking, I like talking to people, I learn a lot, I learn a lot from questions and from discussion, but that's not what's really gonna build our movement right now. There will be times maybe, yes, but not right now. Right now, we need to be building these other movements, not just because it's a way to get our issue out there, but because those movements are important, number one, and number two, those movements are important. And number three, those movements are important. And number 10, it's also a way to get this issue onto the agenda of the public. So I think we need to use this as a moment to rethink how we define what success looks like. And I think we, well, we have a few more. Oh, 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 wait, wait, wait. Phyllis, how do you learn a lot um, in the sense that we're learning from you, and I think one of the bigger wars going on right now is the war on truth and information and what the facts are. Um, <clears throat> sometime, you know, be well before the current phase of the Israeli-Palestinian problem, I thought the Palestinians were all terrorists. I mean, I think of Yasser Arafat. And I think of the bombings, the horrible, you know, terrorist activity in Israel at the time. And it just made the Palestinians look like one big group of terrorists to me. Because I didn't know the facts. Mm -hmm. I didn't know they were fighting for their homeland. So maybe a lot of us didn't know that. And it's so, 
how do we get the data? How do we get it before it's processed and it's misinformed yeah. to us and disinformed? And how do we challenge that war? Thank you. Well, I would say is to the first part of that question, I didn't ask him to say that. But <laughs> I will say those books in the back, um, both of them are primers, and they're done as frequently asked questions. So it's sort of, who are the Palestinians? Why are they in Israel? It's those kinds of questions. Are all Jews Zionists? It's those kinds of questions in, in the Palestine one. The ISIS one is, what is ISIS? Did they start when Obama pulled the troops out of Iraq? Why did they have so many names? You know, it's the basic kinds of questions. So what can I say? I sort of recommend them for, um, you know, for that kind of basic stuff. I think what you have to do, nobody can be an expert on everything. And you don't need to be. You do need to kind of take seriously what you think about what your government is about and think about that as a framework or a lens with, from which you look at the events of the day. And you, know, you can read the New York Times, and you won't learn very much about what to think about something, but you'll get some idea about what is going on in the world. You know, they have, they're one of the few places, the BBC, the New York Times, once in a while, the Washington Post, although less frequently, that has the capacity to have stringers around the world you know, that are feeding stuff in. You, you, know, you can get it. You can get stuff online. It's, there's a lot of specialized uh, websites and stuff that are very useful if you have the background to know which ones are trustworthy and which aren't. That's not so easy. You know what you're getting, say, with the mainstream media. You know the New York Times is going to have a pretty crummy analysis of stuff, but it's also going to have a fairly broad reporting of what happened. So you, know, you weigh that. That's not where you go to figure out what to think, but it's where you go to figure out what happened. Then you do your own thinking. You, know, you figure out who are the five columnists on Israel-Palestine, on Venezuela, on climate change, on whatever your interests are. Who are the five people that are writing about it or speaking about it that you trust? And you go to their websites, or you go to the places where they report stuff, and you read that. And that helps you shape what you think about it. There's no magic to it. It's, um, it's that, yeah. Well, uh, one, the, the couple of Israeli websites that I usually recommend is Haaretz. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is a good left-leaning um, uh, newspaper. And the other one is Beth Salem which is a human rights organization in Israel. And, and they, they're both very good. They um, work really well. We have time for one more question? OK. Are you tired? No, no, we can do one more. OK, one more. It's a short question, not an essay. So um, to follow up on your movement talk, um, the idea of movement and this mass movement for um, people from the 60s and such, this seems to be about outdated and changing policies um, 10 years from now. But the people of Gaza, um, they're going to freeze to death this winter. So we need specific items within a movement for those who care, who can do something. Like she mentioned with the lights, which mm -hmm. I want to know more about. But there need to be very specific, actionable items. Looking at policy, which is important, I think it's too big for me to do anything, so I'll do nothing. But when I'm given small actionable items, it becomes very important. So this winter, give yourself two hours or less per day of electricity to keep your heat on. So you can, and also break out your windows or at least open them so you can know what it's like for the people in Gaza during the winter. We need to do things right now that directly assist people as well. Okay. I agree. I think that that, is, that can be very important. What we can do as individuals tends to be very small scale, and the needs are enormous. But I think those kinds of individual actions are very important. Organizations like UNRWA, which is the main UN agency that has kept the Palestinians alive, uh, medically healthy and, and uh, fed and housed and educated uh, since 1947, um, has what's called um, USA, UNRWA, UNRWA USA, I guess it's called, which is their fundraising arm in the US. And they're running 5Ks around the country to raise money for, uh, for, for UNRWA. Uh, tomorrow night, in not only in my hometown, but two blocks from my house, is a fabulous concert that's a fundraiser for UNRWA. So those kinds of things. People can do a fundraiser. I always think that what you do with a group of people is going to be better than what you do by yourself. So 
along with doing something alone, like opening a window to experience that, that can be useful. But get together somebody from your synagogue, from your church, from your mosque, from your school, from your whatever, and put together, you know, contact the, the office and they'll send you, you know, the material you need, whatever, the tote bags to give as prizes, whatever it is, to say, we're going to do a fundraiser and our goal is to raise $5,000 for UNRWA. If, you know, if, if 300 communities around the country did that, that would be huge. So that kind of stuff can be very important. And it's Im mostly important for the educational purposes. And for those kinds of information and, um, and, and projects, um, United, um, uh, the U.S. Campaign yes, for Palestinian Rights. It's US US campaign campaign for, org. Yeah, um, and, a, and another website. one is the United Methodist for Kairos Response. So we have some projects going. If anybody else, you know, there are other websites. Well, I thank you all very much for coming.